progress in development of superconducting electromagnets in conjunction with the physical effect known as a nuclear magnetic resonance opens the range of a wide applications in the medical and commercial sectors. Okay, so the first commercial application of superconductivity was in nuclear magnetic resonance, known as NMR. And this was the first time people started to make money out of superconductivity rather than spending money on research. So what's NMR about? It's a resonance of the nuclei of a material in a magnetic field. And we can start, let's go back to childhood days and look at the spinning top, because it's interesting to see how spinning objects behave. Now, if I, if I have the top, it stays upright, and it has a spin. If I move the top sideways, you'll see now that it is moving round in a circle. And this is called precession. The force, the nuclei have an intrinsic spin, uh, because they're made of protons and neutrons, and if they are not paired, then there is a net residual spin of the nucleus. And the nucleus, because of that spin, also has a magnetic moment. If you put a magnetic moment in a magnetic field, then it will have a force tending to align it with the magnetic field. Now, if the nucleus was not spinning, it would just move into alignment with the field. Remember, relaxation is the following, that if you start with um, a proton that's spin up, apply a pi over 2 pulse, you knock it down into the xy plane, then processes around the applied field. The relaxation time is the time it takes to come back to the equilibrium position. That precession, that frequency of that precession, is related to the property of the nucleus and to the magnetic field. A very important factor in NMR and MRI is the signal-to-noise ratio, S over N. We find this is proportional to the field strength, B, raised to the power 1.75. But let's suppose we couldn't change the strength of our field, so we had a given uh, magnet. Then uh, what we could do instead to increase the signal to noise is increase the length of the experiment, or the number of scans that we need, little n, which is proportional to the power of no raised to the power of 0.5. So clearly it's much more effective to increase the field strength than to increase the number of scans. Nuclear magnetic resonance data actually occurs in the frequency domain. Let's look at the numbers for this uh, frequency of precession in the magnetic field. If the nucleus has an angular momentum, that's because it has spin of g, and if it has a magnetic moment of m, then we can define this magnetogyric or gyromagnetic ratio, g is m over g, little g, okay? And if we now put that nucleus in the magnetic field, then here we have the relationship between the precession frequency, which is known as the Larmor frequency, and the field B and the magnetogyric ratio. And this was coming out in radians, so I'll put a 2 pi on to make it into, into hertz. So what do these numbers mean in practice? Well, if we have a very typical NMR spectrometer running at a field of 14 tesla, a field you can only get with superconducting magnets, of course, uh, then we have a frequency of 600 megahertz. So we're talking about RF engineering. What's 600 megahertz? Well, it's channel 37 on your TV. That's the sort of number we have. Um, what the enthusiast would like to do is to get to 1 gigahertz, because it turns out that the resolution of your spectrometer gets much better if you go to higher frequencies. That means 23.4 tesla. That's already taking us into either um, HGS materials, or maybe we can get there with niobium tin, maybe with a snifter of tantalum and pumping it down to 1.8K. But that's a good target. But what, what's all this about? Well, um, we've said we have this frequency, and if we have a single atom or a gas where the atoms are not interacting, that is just a single frequency. That's not interesting at all. But now if you put that atom in a molecule, perhaps in a complicated protein molecule, and it's seeing the other atoms around it in different ways, then different atoms have very slightly different fields locally to them. This, this B has become a little B plus delta B due to the neighbors. And so this F is changing a little bit. So what we have now is a spectrum. We don't have a single frequency. We have a spectrum. We have 600 megahertz 
probably covering a range of uh, perhaps 20 hertz either side. So it's a very precise spectrum. Uh, and we have a very precise instrument. So what do we do? Well, I like to think of it as, uh, if you want to tune a bell, a little while I went round a bell factory and I saw men tuning bells and they had a hammer and they hit the bell and then they listened to the tones. So what do we have as the hammer? Well, we send in a pulse of RF waves, quite a short pulse of radio frequency waves at this resonant frequency. And if it's a short pulse, of course, it will also contain a little bit either side of that central frequency. And we excite all these frequencies. And then we stop the pulse, and then we listen very carefully. We see what comes out. And then, of course, we Fourier analyze what comes out. So instead of just hearing the tone, we hear the distribution of frequencies. In order to look at the magnetic resonance spectrum of the sample, we firstly need to put it into the sample holder and turn on an air lift so that the sample is delivered in a controlled manner to the centre of the magnetic field. And the sample is actually going to spin in the magnetic field. So this is now the intensity of the signal versus time to look at nuclear magnetic resonance data in the frequency domain. We need to now do a frequency analysis or Fourier transform of this time domain signal to yield our frequency spectrum. And we can do that. The rightmost peak here is the CH3 peak. The secondmost peak in from the right is the CH2 peak. The thirdmost peak, the bigger peak, is then the OH peak. And it turns out that NMR spectroscopy is used in, uh, in life sciences, in biology, physics, chemistry. MRI isn't just used for medical imaging. Here we're in a chemical engineering lab where it's used to study chemical engineering processes. For example, reactions and filtration. Here we've put a reactor inside the magnet and we can use a combination of NMR spectroscopy and MRI to visualise the chemical conversion of the reaction as a function of position within the reactor. If you're making margarine on a production line and you want to know how much water there is and how much fat in, you can do this with a very crude NMR spectrometer. Using NMR spectroscopy, it's even possible to measure the quality of a wine without opening the bottle.